Welcome to our webinar called Introduction to Raising Heritage Poultry. Our presenter today is Jeanette Berenger from the Livestock Conservancy. I am Larissa McKenna, FACS Humane Farming Program Director, and I'll be moderating this session. Also with us today is Samantha Gasson, uh, FACS Humane Farming Program Associates. Thank you for joining us. Let me just take a minute or two to tell you a little bit more about FACT before we dive right into the presentation. Food Animal Concerns Trust are FACT. We are a national nonprofit organization. We're based out of Illinois, and we work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, such as everyone that's on this webinar, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and by helping consumers make informed food choices. I direct FACS Humane Farming Program, and along with Samantha, we work with livestock and poultry farmers from all across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, personalized materials, a mentorship program, and of course, webinars on a variety of of fascinating topics. Uh, so I invite you to please visit our website to learn all about our farmer services. So this time I'm going to turn the floor over to Samantha who will introduce our guest presenter. All right, thank you, Larissa. I am very excited to be the one who's introducing Jeanette Berenger. I have been involved with um, the Livestock Conservancy for a very, very long time. It was one of the very first things when my husband and I uh, graduated from college and moved to Durham, one of the very first things we did was get a membership with, it was then it was called the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy. Now it's the Livestock Breeds Conservancy and it cost $75 and it was a huge expense as far as we were concerned. But what we got, I think it was quarterly, Jeanette, you can correct me if I'm wrong. We got this beautiful little uh, journal that had all this information about heritage breeds and I kept that stack I, I don't even know how many years worth of journals until about eight years ago when we moved to the farm we're on now and then I threw them all away and now I wish I had them so that I could I could refer to the picture that I have in my mind when I first saw Jeanette and it was a picture of her it's sort of it may have even been this exact same picture we've got on the screen here of Jeanette no it was with a chicken I think I don't think it was with a turkey it was Jeanette with a with a chicken and it was all about heritage breeds and so as far as I'm concerned Jeanette is the expert when it comes to heritage poultry and Jeanette actually shared a little bit of information that she would like us to share with you about her and her background um, so Jeanette is the senior program manager at the Livestock Conservancy. She has 30 years of experience working as an animal professional in zoological and nonprofit institutions. She's an active lecturer, writer, and photographer. Oh, she's a very good photographer, by the way, and is co-author on the best-selling books, An Introduction to American Breeds and Managing Breeds for, so, for Secure Future. Recently, Jeanette was named one of country's women's magazines, 40, uh, 45 Amazing Country Women for her work on conserving endangered breeds. At home, she practices what she preaches and maintains a heritage breed farm with a focus on crit critically endangered, ugh, I forget how to pronounce that chicken name. Jeanette, what's the name? How do you pronounce that chicken name? In in French, it's crève-coeur. Uh, in the US, you could just say crève-coeur. <laughs> It sounds prettier in French. Anyway, so <laughs> without further ado, I am going to turn the virtual mic over to Jeanette. And you guys are going to have so much fun with this webinar. But take it away, Jeanette. All right. Well, um, thank you for coming. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be talking about one of my favorite subjects. I am um, really passionate about poultry, and I'm probably the world's biggest chicken snob. Uh, I, I really enjoy uh, working with the birds, and um, the, the wonderful thing is that you, you don't know everything. Every day is a learning experience with these birds, and just when you think you know everything, you find out something new. And so um, I'm hoping that uh, you know, you'll be able to take home some new things from this presentation. Uh, it's by no means going to be a complete talk. You know, I don't have the time to talk about breeding and the nitty gritty stuff. And I think I'm getting roped into doing a, a presentation in the springtime on that. Um, but <clears throat> my primary focus today is just heritage breeds, getting folks to understand what they're all about, how to make good decisions about them and and be successful. 
So the first question you want to ask yourself, um, well, I, ha I have folks ask, is uh, what are you expecting from the birds? You know, wh what do you want? Do you want e e eggs, meat? Um, do you want birds that are going to do a little bit of both? Are you going to maintain a breeding flock or are you going to rely on hatcheries? Uh, are you going to incubate yourself or are you expecting the chickens to or the turkeys to incubate themselves? So these are all questions that you really need to ask before um, uh, you even think about getting a bird. Uh, you always want to start with a good plan, too, and uh, you're going to have to think about space. Do you have the know-how? Say, for instance, you're thinking of getting into, you know, like um, old English game chickens. They're, they're kind of complicated to manage, and so you might need a mentor to do that. Um, are you going to be selling birds? And if you are, do you actually have a market in your area for that kind of, of animal or um, do you have the marketing know-how to promote what you're going to be doing? Um, where are the breeds going to be? The birds going to be processed? That's a huge one. If uh, because finding a processor that's going to handle privately owned uh, small batches of birds, um, you are you are graced if you've got a place like that near you. Otherwise, you're going to have to do it yourself, and not everybody's going to want to take that on. Um, where are you going to get your chicks? Are you going to depend on a hatchery? Um, are you going to depend upon uh, a private individual? And uh, my big takeaway is make sure that you, well, make an effort to reach out to people that know the breed and have worked with the breed uh, before you get started so that you understand the true ins and outs. And, and we'll go over some of those things that you need to be watching for. Uh, you also want to set realistic goals because heritage birds do not perform like commercial birds. So just, you know, the buck stops there. If you're expecting a heritage bird to grow really, really fast and lay tons of eggs for you right out of the gate, forget it. That's not what heritage birds are about. So don't expect they're going to perform like a commercial bird or a commercial hybrid. And economic sense, a lot of people jump into these birds and put a lot of money into it, and then it turns out to be a real money pit for you. Um, so be realistic about it. You know, I'm always watching how much feed's going into my birds, how much waste I've got. Um, is it taking resources away from other things I should be doing? Um, so look at the money part of it, too, because if they're a financial drain for you, it's not going to be fun having them. Um, I usually tell people if you've got a farm and you want to add heritage breeds, uh, do it carefully. And I would suggest having it as something complimentary or supplementary rather than competing for stuff that's already making you money. And so um, add something a little bit at a time, see if it makes sense and um, that it's not taking away from something that may already be successful for you on, on the farm. Like, um, you know, if you're growing commercial birds and you've got a strong meat business, but you want to go to heritage breeds, um, don't just dump the, the hybrid birds and jump into heritage because that's a whole different ball of wax. And it's going to leave you with a very uh, sour taste uh, when you realize that you, you may have made a mistake. Uh, we'll talk about the different species. Chickens are great. Um, you've got a lot that are geared for both meat and egg production. Um, they're really variable. Some of them are excellent foragers. A lot can be adaptable to climates. Um, chicks really run the full gamut. Some of them can be really easy and others can be really challenging. For the most part, they're all going to be pretty good with insect control. Uh, you know, they're mostly active foragers. And uh, again, uh, meat sales are, are good if you've got the right market for it. Um, not everybody's going to want to pay 20 bucks for a chicken. But the fact of the matter is, if you're raising a heritage bird for meat, you're probably going to put anywhere from 12 to $15 worth of feed into that animal to get it to market weight. Um, so you'll lose your shirt if you don't... Um, ask for a reasonable price where you're going to make money and not every part of the country is going to support those kind of sales. And um, 
So with heritage birds, you want to look at some other ways those birds are going to make you money just beyond the meat and the eggs. When you're thinking about um, meat and eggs, you need to understand there are two body types. And, uh, you know, the egg chickens are going to be more athletic looking like this white leghorn where you've got a white Plymouth rock um, that's clearly a meat bird. And, uh, you know, when you when you're looking at a bird that you're interested in, look at that body type, because that's going to tell you, is it going to be a good layer or is it going to be more of a meat bird? Um, commercial uh, chickens it can work for some folks. You know, they've got a rapid growth rate, higher production weight. They're going to get to market much earlier. Um, you, with commercial strains, you can produce a lot of food in a short period of time, and you're going to get your profits in a very short period of time. Um, some of the options are uh, commercial broilers, which, you know, most of you probably know they can get to market weight at six to eight weeks, which is you know, phenomenal um, growth. Um, I don't know if it's for, for the greater good of the bird, but they grow very, very fast and get to market very fast. And um, commercial birds today all relate to the Chicken of Tomorrow contest that was started by uh, a and um, grocery markets. And um, from this contest, uh, they uh, tried to figure out who can make the fastest growing bird and the biggest bird in the shortest period of time. And this really was a game changer for traditional breeds of poultry and led to the commercial broiler um, development. This is one that gets a lot of people kind of confused um, because heritage breeds have become more popular lately. A lot of um, hatcheries have kind of resorted to these colored broilers and a lot of folks think, oh, they're heritage breeds because they're not white, <laughs> you know. And so you've got, um, uh, they've crossed those broilers with heritage breeds. So you've got birds with color. They grow a little bit smaller, uh, slower, 9 to 11 weeks, um, and maybe have a little more flavor. But they're really not heritage birds. Same thing with layers, you know, you've got um, these layers that grow really fast and produce a lot of eggs in a very short period of time. Um, and they've done the same thing is uh, folks think that, oh, well, they're heritage birds if they're colored and they're really not. Um, but they'll uh, lay a little bit later in life and lay a few less eggs than the commercial birds, but they're really not heritage chickens. Um, so uh, I just wanted to throw that out there for you. Um, there is downsides to commercial birds. Certainly diversity within the population is not going to be so great because when you breed the best to the best to the best, they end up all being kind of related to each other. Uh, they certainly have, um, you know, health problems. Uh, you know, they have uh, disease resistant issues, parasite resistant issues. Uh, fertility decline. I don't know if you saw in the news not that long ago that uh, part of the reason we have a chicken shortage in supermarkets is because some lines of roosters in the commercial world are becoming infertile. So um, that's a big problem. <laughs> um, the other thing is they don't, they've kind of lost their ability to thrive in challenging environments. Commercial birds were meant to grow inside commercial houses. And when you put them outside, um, it's a real challenge for them to be able to thrive. And, you know, I've seen commercial broilers out on pasture and basically they are sitting around the feed and water bowl and not doing much in the way of foraging. You know, they they were built to have a, a hefty appetite. And so they just stick around the food bowl and, and don't do much of anything. Um, your veterinary cost as a farmer could be higher, um, you know, because the animals are inside and in a building, it's going to take a uh, more intense labor to manage them. And, um, you know, you probably would have to replace more than you would with the heritage, um, survivability for commercial birds is not as good as some of the heritage breeds, um. Also, the, another downside I, I should mention is that um, you don't have uh, the ability to have control over your genetics. So if you tried to breed some of these commercial birds, um, 
breeding two of them together is not going to create a bird that's similar to them. Uh, the way you get commercial birds is through um, a three-way uh, crossbreeding, and um, only the the big poultry companies have the resources and the money to be able to produce these hybrid chicks that grow into the birds that you get from the hatchery. So now we'll get into you know what is a heritage bird. So we've got all the commercial birds, the commercial colors. What actually is a heritage bird? And we define it most simply as a long history in the U.S., breeds naturally, thrives outdoors, has a long natural lifespan. I have a leghorn hen right now that's 14 years old, and she looks as good as any of my one-year-old pullets. Um, also, they come from purebred parent and grandparent stock. Uh, with heritage birds, uh, there's a lot of variability. Um, this is a breed that, that I have on my farm called the Crèvecoeur. And you can see the difference between these two birds. Same breed, but the one on the left is from a hatchery and the one on the right is from our breeding. And so um, a lot of the hatchery birds, uh, one of the biggest complaints that I hear is that, you know, they've they don't quite look or meet the breed standard. And that kind of makes sense because if you're a hatchery, you know, you want a bird that's going to lay a lot of eggs because then they're going to produce a lot of babies that they can then sell. And so a lot of times maybe a leg urn or something is thrown in the mix to bump up the, the egg production. And the hatcheries are pretty upfront about that. But if you want the real deal, you know, purebred animal, unless you're getting like an elite line from a hatchery, um, your best bet's going to be to go to a longtime breeder because they're going to be working on selecting for breed standard and, and reinforcing the qualities to make that make that breed what it is. The Crevcore was a uh, top table bird in France for centuries. And so when I'm breeding my creve cores, I want them to be good meat birds. Yeah, they're kind of fancy looking, but their job was to be a meat bird. And so I select for that and as a result have birds that meet the breed standard and are just fabulous table birds. Um, looking at some of the chicken breeds that, that we work with, um, if you want to see a list of the heritage breeds we work with, um, you go on our website, livestockconservancy.org, and go to our conservation priority list. And that will give you a listing of all the breeds that are in need of conservation, either because their numbers have crashed or there are not enough people working with them. And, um, and the list is a really great starting point for you to decide what kind of breed you might think about. Um, one of our more popular heritage breeds is going to be the Legern, and that's because they're great egg layers. Legerns can produce more eggs on less feed than any other uh, breed of chicken. Um, they're not very big because their their bodies are putting a lot of energy into egg laying. And so, um, you know, they're going to be about four to five pounds. They're certainly edible, um, but this is an egg chicken. Don't expect to get a Sunday evening, you know, dinner bird for the table uh, with a legger. And, you know, they're going to be maybe a dinner for two or three, maybe. And, um, um, you know, but they, they are superb egg layers. Uh, another one that's kind of middle of the road, the Australorp, um, this bird is a uh, popular um, egg layer, and uh, they actually hold the world's record for egg laying, believe it or not. Um, there was an Australorp that laid 206, no, 364 eggs in 365 days, and uh, I don't think anything's come close to that bird ever since, but the Australorp is still a decent egg layer, and they lay big brown eggs, and you can see they're a, they're a bit larger than the Legern, and um, so they produce a little bit better carcass. Um, and are a little bit heavier and the, the roosters will get up to seven and a half pounds. So that's a decent sized bird. Um, this is also a breed that people really like for uh, pasture production. They're really good foragers. Um, the buckeye is middle of the road, but more towards the meat side of things. 
and um, they're considered the most active forager in the American class. And uh, they're dynamite uh, birds. They're really laid back. And um, this rooster here was, he was probably over nine pounds. He was huge, but he was gentle as a kitten and really took care of his hens. And matter of fact, died defending his hens uh, from a hawk attack. And um, the Buckeye, uh, you know, is very cold tolerant. And we'll talk a little bit about adaptations for that um, in a bit. Um, but this is a bird that's got, uh, you know, very heavy bodied. So in warmer climates, it's going to be a little more challenging. Um, but they make excellent meat birds and pretty decent layers. If, it, if you just have a small family, you know, 150, 160 eggs a year per hen, that, that's a lot of eggs. You know, they add up pretty quickly. So um, this is another one of the breeds that we work with. Uh, one that a lot of people probably haven't heard of is the Rhode Island White. Everybody's heard about the Rhode Island we uh, Red, but the Rhode Island White was a breed developed not long after the Red. Um, they're really excellent layers, um, and they uh, are easygoing birds. Um, they've got a nice carcass for the table, and um, they really could use work. If you're looking for a breed that could use some... Um, extra support. This would be one. Um, this is a breed you probably want to get from a uh, individual breeder because most of the hatchery birds are hybrids. Uh, Rhode Island white should have a, um, a, ro a pea comb and not a single comb. And uh, they um, uh, most of the hatchery birds have the big single comb. So there's a very active Facebook page for this breed. And um, if you really want to get some nice ones, I'd suggest that'd be a good place to go or go to poultry shows and connect with Rhode Island white breeders. But, uh, I bred them for many years and they really are a nice bird. Uh, Langshan is from the Asiatic, uh, uh, population of, um, chickens and, um, they were part of what was uh, known as hen fever in the 1800s. And these oriental breeds came over from China and just took Europe and America by storm. And um, it's hard to tell by this picture, but she's actually quite a, quite a large uh, hen here. And um, they're, they're one of the taller breeds and um, just lovely animals to deal with. The Langshan has a really active breed club, so you can get really good quality birds from breeders by connecting with the breed club. Um, also, their eggs are really neat. They're almost a, a, got a purplish tint to them and, um, you know, halfway decent uh, egg layers and um, very active foragers. Um, so, uh, again, this is another one that's kind of middle of the road, leaning towards meat a little bit more. So we'll talk a little bit about heritage ducks. Uh, what people, uh, many people don't realize is that some ducks, uh, can outlay chickens by yards <laughs> and, um, they're excellent foragers and, um, especially in wet areas and, tough as nails. They can handle the cold. They can handle the wet. They can handle the heat. Um, ducklings are a piece of cake compared to chicks. Um, they're very robust. And if you've got a lot of slugs and snails on your property, these guys are going to take care of the problem. And um, you, uh, there is a really um, fastly growing, uh, rapidly growing market for duck eggs as more people find themselves allergic to chicken eggs. Um, typically, if they're allergic to chicken eggs, they can still eat duck eggs. And so a lot of our members are raising ducks for that particular market. Um, like with the chickens, if you're going to do meat sales, it's going to be a real challenge to find folks that are going to process the birds for you. You might uh, have to do that yourself. So that should factor in your decision making if you're going to get into them. Um, like the um, chickens, you've got commercial ducks, and um, these are ones that are going to grow really, really fast in a short period of time. And the vast majority of the duck you're going to find out there is going to be the Pekin. Uh, they're very, very common, uh, get really large in a short period of time. Um, but we have a number of heritage ducks that are quite lovely and still really 
pretty productive. Uh, one of my favorite is the Saxony, and um, they definitely outlaid my Buckeyes by yards and uh, grew so fast, I just couldn't get over it. Um, super easy to take care of. Um, a lot of folks think you need a pond to have ducks. You do not. Um, they they can drink from a, a water or just like a chicken does. Um, they do like to dabble uh, to clear out their nostrils. So if the water is just deep enough that they can dabble, they'll be happy that way. Um, I do like to offer uh, a, um, a place that the ducks can uh, wash themselves and swim a little bit. And so I had a small horse trough that the ducks could get into a couple times a week, but ducks can get really messy if you if they're in, uh, have a lot of water, um, uh, that they, they then turn into a giant mud puddle. Uh, runner ducks, uh, they're very popular as egg layers and also as herding ducks. Um, I know folks that, uh, supplement their income with their runner ducks by leasing them out to dog trials. And um, the herders like them because they stick very close together in a flock. And when they're, they move together and, and stay tight, and the, the herders really like that. But they're fabulous egg layers. Um, they're not so much great for a meat bird. Um, you know, they're only up around four and a half pounds. And um, they're edible, but they wouldn't be ideal as a meat bird. Uh, apple yard's probably one of the most common of the heritage breeds that that we work with, and they're uh, among the top of the egg layers. Um, they also have a pretty decent carcass size, getting up to eight to nine pounds, and so they've got a mix of size and egg laying that's really attractive to folks. So that's why they've become uh, fairly popular. The Ancona is an up and coming breed that. Um, was um, originally thought to be a British breed, but after uh, collaborating with some British waterfowl uh, colleagues of mine in the UK, um, it was determined that they were actually an American breed created uh, in New York. And um, they've really um, taken off in the past few years, largely because there's an active Facebook group for them. And um, they're colorful and um, they're great egg layers, excellent foragers. And the group is working really, really hard to have them admitted to the American Poultry Association standard of perfection. Um, and uh, so hopefully that's going to happen in the next few years. But um, there, there are lots of folks working with Anconas and, and uh, they're a fun duck, um, really great foragers. Khaki Campbell's another one that's a superb egg layer and uh, fairly easy to come across. It's a British breed and um, very attractive ducks. Um, they're not as large as the apple yards are. So if you're looking for somewhere middle of the road, then um, uh, Khaki Campbell might be more towards uh, the egg laying side than, than meat birds. Uh, Welsh Harlequin, another really great layer. This one people like really well because they're they're uh, among the top foragers out there. Um, they're very prolific and um, still a, a bit lighter bodied than the apple yards, but you know respectable at five and a half pounds. And then we get into geese, and um, most geese are geared for meat production and. Um, they're all excellent foragers and they are very adaptable. Like the ducks, they're really rough and tumble. Um, the, the goslings are easy to raise. And if you think ducks grow fast, you ain't seen nothing until you see a goose uh, grow up. Um, it's really quite amazing. Um, the great thing about geese, if you are going to be pasture raising animals, is during the time of year where you've got forage, um, they're largely grass eaters. I mean, that's why you see Canada geese on uh, on uh, golf courses all the time because they're eating the grass. And so you can actually supplement your feed bill um, through having foraging opportunities for, for your geese during the warmer months. Um, so that can be attractive, you know, if you're not having to spend money on, on the, um, you know, that portion. I think they can eat maybe 20 to 30 percent of their feed from foraging. Um, that, that hits your, uh, you know, bottom line for, uh, um, 
for feed costs. So that might be uh, of interest to you. Um, the holiday meat sales are pretty strong, but again, like the others, you know, finding a processor that's going to do waterfowl is even more challenging than chickens. And so you want to make sure if you're going to get into geese, find out who's going to be doing the process and because, um, uh, they're few and far between. Um, the other thing I'd mention about geese is they're excellent watchdogs, and um, the geese will know something's going on well before any other animal in the farmyard, and they'll let you know about it. Um, the commercial side of things, the Emden goose is the one that everybody goes with, and they grow really, really fast and, and get big. Um, they're probably the most common goose that's out there. Um, among the heritage breeds, uh, one that I suggest for beginners is the American Buff. Um, they're a super nice breed, um, really laid back, not very noisy, which is rare for a goose breed. Um, they're this beautiful buff color. They're pretty decent egg layers. And, uh, you know, they're smallish for uh, meat birds, but not quite as small as, say, the, the Chinese goose. But if you want to, you know, pardon the pun, dabble in geese, uh, this might be a good starter one for you. Uh, the Toulouse goose is a uh, giant among the geese, and they're just enormous. Um, they're primarily a meat bird, and this is the breed that often was used for foie gras, which is the fattened uh, goose liver um, down in uh, the Toulouse area of France. And um, they can be a little more challenging uh, to breed because they're so heavy bodied. With, with Toulouse geese, you, you definitely are going to need some uh, water at least two feet deep so that they can breed properly with each other because they are so heavy. So if you want to keep them around as pets, um, then you don't need the, the um, deep water. But if you're planning on breeding them, uh, you are going to need that. Uh, they also are challenging to breed. Um, they, uh, they, because their feathering is so profuse around their vent, a lot of breeders actually will pluck the feathers from around the vent to help them with breeding. Um, but they're magnificent geese and, um, you know, they just, it, you got to be next to one to appreciate them. They're just ginormous, beautiful animals. And the Toulouse geese that we work with are the dewlap Toulouse. And you can see with that, um, that dewlap under the chin there, um, there is commercial Toulouse geese out there, but they're not nearly as big and won't have that dewlap. This one here is the traditional type of Toulouse. The one without the dewlap is more of a commercial Toulouse. Cotton Patch is gaining uh, popularity in leaps and bounds. This is a rustic breed from the deep south that, you know, its name implies they used them as weed or geese in the cotton fields. And uh, the advantage to these guys is they still have the ability to fly. And so if you've got uh, these birds out there weeding for you and a predator comes along, um, they can much more easily get away than other goose breeds can. Um, so they're very adaptable. They're paying attention all the time. And um, if you've got some, some weeding to do, this is going to be like a premier goose for you to um, use. Um, they have a very active group on Facebook and um, there's a high demand for them. So if you're thinking of getting cotton patch, I'd place your orders now because when you get closer to hatching season, you're probably not going to find any. Chinese are by far the best layers. That said, it's still only 40 to 100 eggs, but for a goose, that's a lot. Um, Chinese geese are most often used as watchdogs. And I've talked to a lot of old timers in the deep south and the only goose they really kept were the Chinese goose geese because they could just shoot Canada geese um, for meat. But the Chinese geese were kept around as watchdogs to let them know if anything's coming around the farmyard. And as you might imagine, they're one of the more noisy uh, goose breeds out there. They, they're really talking all the time. Um, you've got a brown variety here, and then you have a white variety of Chinese geese. And finally, turkeys, uh, as uh, most of you know, they're primarily geared for meat production. 
um, excellent foragers and, um, you know, especially for insect control, I say the, the only bug the turkey won't eat is the one it can't catch. Uh, they're really good at that. Um, they're very adaptable to, to all kinds of climates. Um, the, of all the, um, poultry species we're talking about, uh, turkey poults are probably the most challenging to, to raise, um, no offense to turkeys, but poults are not the sharpest tools in the shed, and it might take them a while to figure out where the food is and where the heat is and to, you know, walk away from the heat if they get too hot or go to the heat if they get too cold. Um, poults are a real challenge. Um, once they get going, they're fine. And actually, some people will actually put um, uh, chicks in with the uh, uh, turkeys to... Um, uh, teach the poults how to eat. <laughs> um, there is a lot of folks that that don't like to um, raise chickens and turkeys together, and that's primarily due to histo histomoniasis or blackhead, and that is caused by a protozoa that chickens can often carry and it doesn't bother them, but when young turkeys get it, it can be really deadly really fast, especially for the young poults. And so... Um, a lot of folks don't raise the two together, but if you happen to be in an area of the country that doesn't have blackhead as an issue, there are plenty of folks that raise them together. And the other thing is, um, you know, the, the exposure load. Um, if you keep the young poults off the ground and then slowly introduce them to the ground over a period of time, they can build up a resistance to that protozoa. But putting young poults out on pasture first thing um, after they hatch um, can, can spell uh, doom for them if you've got blackhead in the area. Um, holiday meat sales are really strong with heritage birds, especially if you can build up a reputation. Uh, as a good producer. Um, so, you know, raising these birds for the holiday market, you really want to pay attention to how you finish them and making sure that you're producing a beautiful carcass and people will come back to, um, to you for the following year. Um, there seems to be more uh, demand than product with heritage turkeys. The other thing is a lot of the longtime turkey breeders out there, they're, you know, retiring and getting out. And so we're losing uh, uh, quite a few longtime breeders and very few people to replace them. And so um, if you're looking for a conservation project, uh, turkeys would be a great one because we really need to have folks uh, breeding more of these. Most folks just want to raise them for the holidays, have them butchered and be done with them. What we need is people that are willing to continue with them and breed them and be a resource for the poults that other people will raise. Um, commercial turkeys, most of them, uh, you know, are the big white birds that you, um, you know, you see on the commercial farms. Um, but they're doing the same thing as they do with chickens. They add a little bit of color to them and all of a sudden they're heritage birds. Um, if you see uh, turkeys, uh, especially the bronze ones that have these huge breasts and their backs are parallel to the ground, um, they're probably not a heritage bird, but they'll stick the word heritage on them and sell them to people that don't know any better. Um, the thing with these animals is, um, like the white commercial birds, they still can't mate naturally, and they're completely dependent on artificial insemination for reproduction. Um, so they're still, even though they're colored, they're still strictly a commercial bird. Uh, one of the most common heritage breeds is the standard bronze, and uh, they get quite large and get up to 36 pounds or more. Um, and this was the turkey that everybody had for, for Thanksgiving before the commercial birds started out. Um, as the name implies, they have this bronzing on their feathers that really creates this beautiful prism of color on, on their bodies. And um, they're just beautiful, beautiful turkeys but they do get quite large. Black turkeys are another one that gets really, really large. And uh, the challenge with the black turkeys is in their um, ink spots. 
So the black feathers sometimes leave these ink spots in the skin, which is completely harmless. It, it, you know, it doesn't do anything for the taste. It's not, you know, it's not a detriment in any way, shape or form other than visually. And some people get put off by that. So if you're raising black turkeys, you need to educate your customers that there may be ink spots that are just caused by the pin feathers and that it, you know, it's not anything bad at all, but it does put off some people. Um, black turkeys really need folks to take them on because some folks just don't want to deal with that part of their um, production and, and explain to people what it is. And sometimes even at the processing plant, you have to explain that these guys might have ink spots. And, and um, so, uh, but they're another large, beautiful bird, um, very tasty. Uh, bourbon red, another big one, although finding really good big bourbon reds that are properly colored uh, um, is a challenge. A lot of times you'll see bourbon reds that, uh, you know, birds that are sold as bourbon reds and they'll be kind of a light brown as opposed to this, um, you know, deep, deep um, uh, uh, mahogany red. Um, this is a good colored bird, but a lot of them you get from the hatcheries will not have that kind of color. Um, so, and it's, it's a tough color to perfect, which is why um, not a lot of folks get into breeding them, but they're a pleasant bird. Uh, like the others, they get pretty large and, uh, but they're really flashy. And um, they also uh, pick really um, nicely you know, they're, uh, they don't have dark pin feathers. And um, so when you go to process them at Thanksgiving time, um, they, they look cleaner than some of the dark feathered birds. Midget white. Um, this is one that was actually developed for egg laying and is the best layer of all the turkey breeds. Um, that's relatively speaking, because good laying is like 60 to 80 eggs, whereas, you know, a chicken's going to be 300. Um, but midget whites are decent egg layers. And um, we actually worked with a producer that had a large flock of them, and he could only sell so many turkey eggs um, um, to his market. And so we were trying to figure out, you know, what, what are they good for? And I, I saw somebody was talking about eating turkey eggs. Um, what we did is partnered with the uh, uh, Culinary Institute in, in New York and um, gave the pastry chefs a whole bunch of turkey eggs. And they experimented with the eggs and found that they were fabulous for desserts, that um, they made the best creme brulee they've ever made with any egg. And um, the only thing they're not good for is the lighter pastries like angel food cake. Um, you you want to uh, use the eggs for thicker stuff. Also, turkey eggs are preferred for um, um, egg noodle production with the Amish. And, uh, you know, when you're looking at all the breeds and the species, the last question you ask yourself is, do you like the breed? And everybody jumps to that question first. Oh, that's a cool bird and I want to get it without asking all these other questions or understanding um, what it is that bird can do for you. And, you know, you, it's like trying to fit a, a, a square peg in a round hole. Um, you know, if you want to get a lot of eggs, but you get a bird like the Buckeye, um, you know, it's not going to meet your expectation. And so um, this is one of the last questions you ask yourself. And and then, you you know, after you've whittled down what you need and, and, and what that bird can do from you, you'll have a small list of breeds to choose from, and that's going to be your best bet for being successful. The thing with heritage breeds is uh, they have a lot of marketing advantages. Um, they're excellent homestead uh, birds most of the time, not 100% of the time. Um, and a lot of them can be raised on a lower protein diet because uh, they, they're foraging a lot. Um, if they're in a coop and can't get out and forage, that might not be the case. Um, 
you know, the, uh, they all have stories. Uh, one of the reasons Cotton Patch are doing so well is people love the story of them being the old wheat or geese in the cotton fields and, and they've got a rich history and, you know, the Campbell is an old English breed. And, and um, so, you know, so, unlike commercial birds, Heritage birds have stories that capture people. And when you're trying to market your birds, you want to be able to tell their story because that's what grabs people. The other advantage is, is unlike the commercial birds, you can have color variations and um, offer different products that um, you know, people don't see every day. So, um, you know, with the turkeys, if you're done with hatching, but they're still laying, you can market your turkey eggs. Um, same thing with the duck eggs, but make sure that you educate your customers on how to use those eggs. For instance, don't use a turkey egg to make angel food cake. Um, and with chickens, you can add breeds in that have different colored eggs uh, you know, the, the Americanas will have the, the greenish eggs or the Ancona, uh, Aracana, um, you know, will have uh, the blue. Um, with ducks, you can actually get different colored eggs, too, with the um, Cayuga duck. Um, when they start laying, the eggs are almost black. <laughs> you know, it's really bizarre. And then uh, during the season, they'll lighten up to become a pale green towards the end of the season. And color in your egg box can take your dozen eggs from say five dollars to ten dollars because people love to get the colored eggs they don't taste any differently <laughs> you know there's no uh you know um nutritional difference it's just all visual but people love the multicolored eggs and so you can get more of a return on your eggs by mixing it up a bit um, you know, take advantage of their foraging opportunities. Like I said, with the, with the geese, you know, I think they can get up to 30% if they've got really good pasture. Even with chickens, you can get, you know, 20% of their diet from forage. And I found with my legerins almost even higher, um, you know, if they're able to go out and, and um, forage, that's not going to be year round. Um, and then also uh, there are some breeds that can even forage in the woods really well. Uh, my Buckeyes, um, I have only woods on my farm and my Buckeyes would get every bit as big as my buddy's Buckeyes that were on great pasture. Uh, my birds just foraged in the woods, but they found bugs and, and you know, amphibians. And I think I even saw them with the snake once. Um, they just you know, ate whatever was available and took advantage of it and grew really, really well. It also adds to their flavor profile if they can go out and forage. Um, we, we really do encourage people to do pasture poultry. Not everybody can do it, um, but it is a, a bit more sustainable because, you know, the, the, the feces are getting spread out over a, a larger area and are breaking down um, much more rapidly. Um, definitely nutritional benefits, especially if you're going to be breeding birds, uh, the nutritional benefits will equate into uh, better fertility. And right now the public really uh, likes to um, uh, know that their birds are out on pasture and, and, um, for passion birds, really, the, the demand outweighs the supply. Um, and that's largely because, you know, pastured birds take a bit longer to, to get up to market weight. And, and um, you know, they're going to be uh, a little more challenging to produce a lot in a short period of time because you've only got limited pasture. Um, but a lot of the breeds, uh, considered heritage breeds, do fabulous on pasture. There's certainly challenges on pasture. Um, they're certainly vulnerable to predators. And the number one predator is the ne uh, neighborhood dog. And um, uh, certainly severe weather, they're going to be less protected than if they're in a um, barn with a cement floor. Uh, you're going to have escapees. Uh, I mentioned earlier, they cost a little bit more to produce because they're slower growing. Um, but if you want to make money on pastured um, uh, chickens, 
you really got to put some effort into marketing to let people know they cost more because they're worth more and the experience you're going to have consuming uh, a pastured bird's meat or eggs, the flavor is going to be different and it's just going to be a great experience if you spend the time educating your consumer. So we'll talk a little bit about methods. Um, you know, having an enclosed tractor is a common um, uh, way to go for a lot of folks. Not every breed is going to do well in a chicken tractor like Buckeyes. They really like to roam and they're not going to do well in a small confined area. Um, so make sure the breed that you have um, is the type of bird that's going to do OK being confined in a small space. And, um, Pat, you know, putting them in a tractor is not really free range per se, um, but, you know, at least it's got them out foraging on natural foodstuffs. Uh, depending on how many birds you have in the tractor, if you've got a lot of birds, yeah, you're going to have to move it more often. You also, if, if it's only you, make sure your tractor is, um, you're capable of moving it by yourself. If you need two or three people to move it, um, realistically, that's just not doable if, you know, you don't have people around you 24, you know, seven days a week to be able to move the tractors. Um, but this is a great way to go for small batches. Um, the most common pasture poultry is day ranging with the mobile coop and, and fencing. Um, this is one that, uh, you know, you don't have to move as often. It's really going to be open to aerial predators and uh, they can be a real challenge. Uh, there's a farm down in Georgia, uh, White Oak, that um, the bald eagles have discovered there's plenty to eat down there. And his chickens are just getting wiped out by bald eagles. Um, in this kind of situation, you probably should have a guardian animal like a dog. Um, if you have issues with aerial predators and you might not have the issue today or tomorrow, but eventually some raptor is going to figure out that there's free lunch down there and, and figure out that there's easy pickings. So, um, you know, there's good and bad with, with day ranging, um, uh, coops, but that's definitely the most efficient way to be raising these kind of birds. I mentioned silvo pasturing a little bit earlier. These are some of my um, buckeye uh, chicks roaming around. Um, you know, you don't have to have a, a pristine um, uh, pasture for birds to take advantage of roaming. And as I said, the, um, the buckeye breed in particular, because they do get really big, they can take advantages of larger foodstuffs that some of the smaller birds um, can't do. You, you don't want to put too many in the woods because they can impact, uh, you know, the area um, in a shorter period of time. So silvo pasturing is not for high density um, flocks. You know, if you've got a flock of 10 or 12 or 20, um, it'd be fine. But if you're talking about hundreds, silvo pasturing is probably not going to be the way to go. Uh, another income stream uh, you we really need to take into consideration when you're doing heritage breeds is um, income for, from breeding stock. But that means you have to put a lot of thought and effort into how you're breeding your animals. And um, the, this photo on top was uh, from our Buckeye project. And over a um, four-year, five-year period, we were able to take these birds that were really variable. Some were small, some were big, some were colored well, some weren't, and put a lot of selection into those birds. And by the end of it, we had birds that were meeting breed standard. And a good friend of mine, um, Don Schreider, who's the second from the left there, um, he's a master poultry breeder, and he took one of our Buckeyes, um, to the uh, Ohio National and just floored the judges. Nobody had seen a Buckeye as good as that in decades. And, and the bird took the American class and that's not happened with a Buckeye for, for a long, long time. And so the value of, of putting effort into doing the right kind of selection for your birds 
in the end is going to be able to have you produce birds that are going to be attractive to other customers besides those that are eating the products. Um, people that know chickens, if, if, if you've got really good chickens and they really want that quality, they will pay the price um, for that bird. Um, Don, he's been a master breeder of Lagerns for decades and, you know, if you're not willing to pay $50 a dozen for his leg or eggs, you're not going to get them because he's put decades of work into those birds and they are worth that amount of money. Um, you also have to keep in mind that, um, you know, you're paying for all the effort that somebody else has put into those birds. And so um, getting good quality birds to start. Um, you know, a, an investment in that is the is your best bet if you're if you're looking to supplement your income with selling breeding stock. Now, if you're just getting started and you want to try out a breed, by all means, get hatchery birds. That way, if if it fails or you don't like it, you're not impacting the gene pool of these rare breeds and really good specimens of these rare breeds. So, um, uh, you know, there, there are two ways to approach it, and there's nothing wrong with hatchery birds. It'll give you a good taste of the breed, and then if you want to get serious with it, go to a breeder that knows what they're doing and bite the bullet and invest in some quality stock. You want to multitask your breeds to get every bit of resources you can from them. You know, we talked about you can use them as security guards. You know, if your geese alert you to the fact that there's a fox around your hen house, you're, you're going to save a lot of money by that goose giving you a heads up and you not losing all those um, animals. Um, I love the fact that I could put my geese in the front yard and, and they took care of the grass. I didn't have to cut grass for a whole summer. That saved me the time, the energy, and the gas. Um, you know, be open-minded to the products that um, you, they can give you. It might not just be eggs. There could be meat products. And, and think about how much you can save in pest control if your ducks can take care of all the slugs in your garden, then you don't have to worry about putting pesticides in there to get rid of them. And of course, weeding with the geese. Um, we do have some resources online, uh, uh, how to raise heritage turkeys on pasture. And that's um, uh, a guide for people that want to raise uh, turkeys for the holiday market. Um, we also have a, um, a turkey uh, breeding manual, and that will show you from beginning to end how to select birds to be breeders for your program. Um, we have similar for chickens. Um, if you want to know how to breed a better chicken, our assessment for breeder selection is an excellent resource, you know, free for download. Um, we also have some biosecurity pieces and um, financial resources, uh, you know, different grant programs that are out there that can give you help. We also have an online breeders and products directory. If you're looking for these animals, you can find them on our website. We have a couple of books out, Introduction to Heritage Breeds. So if you're thinking about working with them, that book will give you the hows and whys of um, why heritage breeds, uh, you know, um, uh, some of the basic principles. And then if you want to get into something a little more advanced, um, managing breeds for a secure future, um, that hel helps you with understanding conservation breeding strategies and how to form breed associations and breed clubs. And that's more of like a college type text that does a real deep dive into working with heritage breeds. And at this point, um, I can start to take some questions. I have three pages of questions that were submitted to me, and I don't know if I can get to all of them, but uh, maybe I can get some help from Alorza. Yes, of course. Thank you so much, Jeanette. That was really wonderful. And we did have a, a bunch of questions that have come in during this, uh, this presentation as well. That, um, I'm happy to kind of help moderate. I think Sam is gonna help as well. Um, and we'll see what we can get to. Uh, I know there might be some opportunities for follow-up and mm -hmm. I know there has also been some um, other requests for follow-up um, 
uh, presentations, perhaps uh, in the new year. <laughs> okay. So let me just, I'm going to scroll back up and get to some of the, the questions that folks had about ducks first, and we'll kind of work our way through. Um, sure. And Samantha's going to kind of, we'll kind of alternate um, as we go. But um, so, so I'm going to kind of combine a couple of questions, but people are wondering about kind of environments for, for ducks, um, both in terms of, let's say someone lives by a river, is that an issue? And also what kind of housing is recommended? Um, for ducks, I would um, have something that's easy to clean because, you know, they, when they um, defecate, it's very wet and messy. And so um, you definitely want to have something that's going to be a, a snap to clean and keep dry um, a lot of folks will will have them in a, a pen with a dirt floor and then put straw down um, as an option. Um, the great thing about ducks is they all lay in the morning. So if you just leave them in the coop uh, long enough, like maybe till 10 o'clock, um, they will have laid their eggs and you can let them loose and then you don't have to hunt down where they've laid their eggs. Um, so, uh, definitely have nest boxes in your duck house and, um, uh, they'll be, they'll be happy with the, with the straw, you can do deep, deep bedding. And so you can, um, keep adding the straw and then, uh, especially in the winter time, um, you know, you just add the straw and then in the spring you can take it out of the coop and then, um, use that as compost. Um, so that can be useful too. All right, I'm going to ask the next question. Um, we're going to have one more question about ducks and then move on to chickens. Uh, how about male ducks? Do they coexist well or do you have to worry about fighting like you do with the roosters? Um, they can coexist. Uh, you do have exceptions, but if you've got enough females out there, um, I, I very often see multiple drakes together. Um, but it, you know, it also depends on the enclosure, you know, their night housing, if the night housing is really, really small, you might have, um, birds that get kind of kicked out of the group. So it's all about space and not squeezing them into too tight a space, um, so that they're in each other's face all the time. Um, you can also do visual barriers if you've got limited space, kind of like anything from hanging up some burlap to, you know, cut the line of sight between animals, or I like to um, TP uh, uh, pallets. So I'll take two wooden pallets and put them together kind of like a TP. And that way the birds can go under or around or just get away from each other. Um, and that that's a great peacekeeper for almost any um, species. All right. And then the next question is, do you have any any chicken breeds that you would suggest for beginners? Um, they are looking for uh, layers and so hybrid birds, so a layer and a meat bird. Yeah. Um, you know, an easy one to start with is going to be the um, Australorps. And um, there's some really good ones out there. Um, they're, they're easy to deal with, excellent layers, you know, halfway decent meat birds. Um, the, um, you know, the Buckeye is another one that, um, typically is real easy to deal with and, and, uh, excellent meat birds, especially if you like dark meat. Um, that's something I shouldn't have mentioned about the Buckeye is the Buckeye is like all dark meat. Even their breast meat is dark. If you like that, then, you know, you're going to love the Buckeye. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, so moving on to geese, someone's asking, can geese forage on very long grass? Um, they, it depends. Um, you know, like if you're talking about Johnson grass, they're probably going to ignore that, you know, because it's really gritty. I think they do like the, the fresher shoots and the younger grasses. I, I think they can, the big one, uh, the tall stuff, they can forage on uh, limited. Um, but I think they become, the grasses become a lot more fibrous at that point. So it's not going to be as attractive. All right. I'm going to ask the next question. This is actually a question that I asked. And it's probably, I probably should skip it, but I really want to know the answer to this. So, um, when you're concerned, if you're concerned about putting your turkeys in with your chickens about because of blackhead, um, mm -hmm. 
I've heard that it's it's not as big of a deal if you've got meat chickens going in with your pastured bird, your turkeys, um, just because they they're younger and they just don't quite have the uh, protozoan load that a uh, a laying hen would have, and that it's more dangerous to put your layers or put your turkeys in an area that your layers have been in. Is that true? I've never heard that. Um, I've just heard that chickens can be a problem and. I've seen plenty of people raising both together side by side and uh, or in the same pen even. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a matter of introducing the poult slowly to the ground. So a lot of folks do a sun porch where they go outside, but they're off the ground. And then you limit their exposure where they can go out and forage just for a little amount of time. Um, but you know, I, I talked to my extension agent to see if blackhead is an issue in your area. Cause like I said, uh, there are parts of the country where it's really not an issue. Thank you. All right. So we have a question, um, about differences in flavor, for example, with bourbon reds or any other heritage poultry, is there a difference in flavor in hatchery birds or is the, uh, are the main differences uh, simply in appearance? Um, I think um, the, the different, there is a difference, um, uh, you know, the hatchery birds, um, you know, they, well, let me think about this now. <laughs> With the hatchery birds, I think the flavor is going to be similar, but maybe the carcass performance might not be quite as nice as something you get from a good breeder. The flavor profiles can be very similar because uh, if they're foraging on the same forages, um, you know, that builds it. Uh, I have a friend that um, did Beltsville small whites and for the last several weeks, she'd let them forage in her woods. And she thought that really improved their flavor profile in the end. And she raised, you know, several different varieties of turkey besides her Beltsville and they all have great flavor. So, you know, it really is, uh, they are what they eat. It's just the carcass might be a little bit different. Don't expect a hatchery bird to perform as well as someone that has put a lot of selection into their line of turkeys. All right, thank you. So I'm just doing some scrolling. Where are we, Samantha? Um, I, I, mean, I look like oh. maybe the next one is, um, uh, would any species except chickens forage in my compost? Um, Yes, I think they would. Um, you know, if there's bugs in there, the others are going to. Uh, but I can hear my, my husband's voice in the back that they're killing my critical mass. And, <laughs> you know, the, the bigger birds will get into the compost pile and dig it up and then, you know, could mess up your, you know, you know your, your composting. Um, but, yeah, they take advantage of it. If there's bugs there, they're going to take advantage of it. Awesome. Oh my goodness. I want to mention, um, I know that uh, Jeanette was talking about some predation issues uh, with for, um, pasteurized systems. And I just wanted to uh, let folks know that we, in fact, does have a whole series of recorded webinars with um, expert Jan Donor that explore livestock guardian animals, including dogs and other animals, as well as some um, tips for um, managing and preventing and controlling um, predation pasture mm -hmm. systems. So those might be really good as you're considering um, yeah, your... It's, it's really important with the heritage breeds that, um, you know, you're working with something rare so protect it, please. I see people getting really, really rare birds. And then they're like, oh, well, a fox wiped them all out. And it's like, you know, if, if you're going to the trouble of, of working with a rare breed, and especially if you're getting critically endangered birds, you know, like my craft cores, they are in a chicken Fort Knox. You know, it, I've got protection above, protection below. They've got you know, a cement floor in the coop that nothing can dig under, you know, because they're critically endangered. And I went to a lot of trouble to get them. And so um, don't say that you didn't know or you got caught off guard. You know, there are foxes out there. You know, there are owls, there are hawks. 
you know, if you're getting a rare breed, please protect them. <laughs> and just, I'll, I'll say also that J, uh, Jan series is really, really good. So you should check that out. Um, she's got a lot of really good information. and She's written quite a few uh, books as well. Um, uh, also, someone plugged your book, Jeanette, um, or oh, one of your, your books, the, the the deeper dive book. That was someone saying that really was a life changing. Um, Sam, we probably have we probably have time for about two more questions. My goodness, oh, we're getting down there. Let me ask this one from from Jason. Um, it's not particular to poultry per se, but which there. Well, I guess it is in terms of, but it's a part of a bigger system. Which breeds will do best in rotational grazing after goats, sheep, and cows? Any thoughts on that, Jeanette? Um, I might go with with geese or ducks. Um, I know that uh, I've got a friend who has a hog island sheep and she has her ducks following the sheep and she's got almost like zero parasite issues. So that might be a good one. Um, or, or geese, because, you know, geese are going to forage a little bit differently than the others and break up some of the parasite cycles. Excellent. Oh my goodness. Um, any other ones, Sam, that you see? I know that, I'm sorry if folks, if I'm kind of scrolling and there's a, they came in at different places as well. <laughs> um, so, okay. uh, oh, go ahead. So, me, uh, as a, just as a follow-up with this uh, from that question, and I'll let Sam ask one more, but um, someone's asking, do you recommend putting chickens in with other livestock, such as hogs or goats at the same time? Um. Oh, I've, I've had them in with hogs and I've had the hogs bite their heads off when they tried to get in the food bowl. So, um, and then I've seen the hogs cohabitate just fine. I think if you're going to mix them, um, you know, just be careful around feeding time because the chickens get, you know, really excited about, you know, the feed on the, in, in the, trough and sometimes they'll jump in the trough and you know the animal that's eating that feed might not be so happy about it um but you know they're great for gleaning up the um you know the leftover grains and stuff which means you're going to have fewer rodent problems so they're definitely great to have around with other species just around feeding time make sure the chickens aren't getting in a place where they're going to get their heads bit off <laughs> I, I shouldn't have laughed that hard. I'm just thinking about my hogs and they would definitely take off some chicken heads. There's no way they'd laugh. Yeah. And this was in a zoological setting in front of a crowd of people. Oh, it, no, it was not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> we, we actually put our chickens, um, they follow our, uh, our sheep and our cows and they do a really good job of spreading out the manure. So um, they definitely have their place, I think, with other in a multi-species situation. Um, and I was going to, there's, there's a, a question about, oh, somebody said that Plymouth Rocks do a great, great job cleaning up behind the sheep and pigs. Um, oh, sure. This is from Kim. She uh, said she, she actually put this question in the when she registered, but is there any easy accessible resources I can share with customers on the best way to cook heritage breed post, poultry? Um, hmm. There's not um, one resource, although uh, I, I just happened to start a series in our newsletter on um, finishing animals, because um, it's a really uh, complicated question, um, depending on the species that you work with. So um, every issue I'm going to be covering how to raise and prepare um, different stages of uh, poultry. Uh, well, actually, with all the species we work with, barring horses and donkeys, because people don't want to hear how, how to eat them. <laughs> but and I don't eat them. Um, but um, with chickens, for instance, you've got um, spring chicken. Uh, you know, which is a bird that's processed when it's about four weeks old, and then you've got you know, the fryer, and then you've got the broiler, and then you have the roaster, and then what do you do at roosters? What do you do at spent hens? And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm going through uh, what you do with each level. Um, but uh, the short answer is there's no one resource for it. Um, but certainly you can um, 
check our Facebook page. A lot of times I'll post stuff about the culinary aspects of the animals. Um, I have an active Facebook page for the Crevcore Chicken Conservation Project. And a lot of the techniques I put there would be appropriate for almost any chicken. Um, the key is low and slow for a lot of them, unless they're young birds. But um, say you've got a rooster that you don't need anymore and want to process, you know, you can put them in a Dutch oven, um, you know, at 275 for three and a half hours and it'll come out phenomenal. Um, or I've just recently been playing around with spatchcocking, which is removing the backbone and splitting the bird. Because when we've got small birds that are only maybe 16 or 18 weeks old, um, my husband is very cranky about having to eviscerate going into the small cavity and just, but um, we've started spatchcocking those birds. And not only is it easier to um, process, but they also cook very quickly. And so for a spatchcock chicken, you can um, flatten it out, you know, brown it on both sides um, and then stick the pan in the oven for like another 40 minutes at 450. And you've got a fabulous bird that's nice and crispy and, and juicy. And, but that's not something you can do with a, a rooster or a hen. And, uh, and even with an older bird, like if a bird's got up around 20 weeks or 28 weeks, that's when they're starting to change a little bit. And, and so, you know, it, it depends on the stage that the bird's in, the life stage. And, um, but if you, if you understand the cooking method that works for that particular stage, they're all really good. You know, one of my favorites is to cook roosters and I'll have a rooster in the oven in a covered dish and then go out to my coops. That's like, you know, 50, 100 feet away. And I can smell that bird cooking in my kitchen. I mean, just amazing aroma and flavor. And it's just, it, it's beautiful stuff. And then, it, you know, um, it, it sounds uh, complicated, but there are so many different techniques you can use to get a good product. And um, um, I'm hoping eventually a book will come out, um, but I'm doing this series first and then maybe compiling everything into a book. Thank you for that, Jenna. And, and I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I, I'm going to ask one last question just as um, mm -hmm. I think it's relevant, but some, it came in on the Q&A. Um, what should be the main prior, priority for harsher or colder climates when you're raising these heritage birds? Um, cold adaptation, certainly. So don't go picking a bird with a huge, you know, single comb or big wattles. Um, you could certainly keep them in colder climates, but then that means you probably need to have some heat in the barn. So, um, you know, that's added expense. If you're in a really cold climate, think about something like a Chanticleer chicken that um, has a very tiny comb. They're cold adapted. They're good winter layers. So if you're in the northern climates, um, it's still going to be laying in the winter. And, um, uh, you know, there, there are a number of breeds that do just fine. Up in Canada, there are a lot of goose breeders up there. Uh, geese do really, really well in cold climates. Um, the ones with the big knobs um, over their nose, like the Chinese or the African, they probably won't do as well but the other breeds would do fine. The big thing though is ice. You know, if you've got a lot of ice, that can be an issue if the birds splay legs or um, slip. And so you wanna make sure that, you know, if you've got icy patches that you throw straw or hay down. Um, I used to live in New England, so that was my go-to was just putting hay or straw down for them. Um, Goose, uh, geese and ducks uh, will get frostbitten if they don't have access to like open water and are stuck on the snow and ice. So make sure they're able to get off the snow and ice. 
Excellent. Thanks for that, those tips. Well, let me just take a moment to do a few housekeeping items before we sign off officially. A uh, reminder that right after this webinar ends, uh, there's going to be a very short survey that pops up on your screen. Uh, if you could just take a minute or two, it shouldn't take more than that, to give us your feedback about this topic, this webinar, your experience, and what you might like to see in the future. We certainly take all of that into account and consideration. Um, also, I know this is been a question. It, uh, recording This recording and the slides are going to be archived on our website, and everyone that registered, which is everyone on this webinar, uh, will be receiving an email from me, uh, hopefully by the end of the day, if everything goes as planned, with links to those resources. So I want to do a quick plug, give a, a quick club, uh, plug for some of the other opportunities that we have coming up this fall, including a bunch of webinars over the next month and a half. Um, we're also currently accepting applications for our Humane Farming Mentorship Program through the end of the year. And I should say that Jeanette is uh, serving as a mentor this year, and we've been really lucky to have her. Um, so if you're interested in, in either being a mentee or a mentor, uh, I'll provide an, uh, a link to that in my email. Um, and then people are also wondering about our Fund a Farmer grants. We're looking to open up the application for those next week. So keep an eye out for that announcement. And then of course, don't forget about our scholarships that are available for trainings and events um, as you're planning ahead for both virtual and in-person meetings. Um, I will make sure that you, you all have those links. So I think that's about all the time we have for today. I really just wanna say thank you so much, Jeanette, for spending the afternoon with us and taking the time to share all of this you know, amazing knowledge and expertise and um, answering questions so, so well. Um, we really, really appreciate all the useful information and I hope that you'll come back and be with us again sometime um, in the next couple of months. I know folks would love that. And I also wanna say thank you to my co-host, Samantha, and to everyone out in the audience for taking the time and being with us and interacting so well, sharing your experience as well in the chat. It's really nice to see people engaging. So I hope that we are all able to connect again soon and that you have a, a wonderful rest of the day. So thanks, everyone. See you um, later. Bye. Okay.